in any event, how can one measure such an amorphous, ineffable item as culture? How could we ever determine whether their culture has penetrated our di or diluted our culture? For that matter, uh, might it not be good for us to get further exposed to some of the uh, salutary values of traditional cultures? In any event, there can be no precise measurement, but one can, by logic, begin to try to sense the nature of the situation. Thus, we have said that Western culture was dominant 40-odd years ago, after the end of World War II, when the West made up about 22% of the Earth's population. Today, the West comprises 15%, and we are still dominant. Because of, demo dem demo because of demographic echo effects dealing mostly with people already born, it is just about a sure thing that it will uh, decline to under 9% by 2025, and probably down to 5% by 2100, if present trends continue. When does our ineffable but very real culture begin to dilute or erode in a harmful way? At 10%? At 5%? At 1%? As it happens, if it happens, what will it mean? It is unlikely that the U.S. will be farmed by the power of water buffalo. Will we worship cows? We will not. <laughs> we will, willing will we willingly abandon democracy? We will not. All that seems unreal, but it is equally unreal to suggest that our values will remain untouched as our numbers go down and down and down, if our economic and military power go down and down and down. It will be difficult for tiny minorities growing weaker, we Westerners, <laughs> to set the tone or values of the world. And values, as noted earlier, can be contagious one way or the other. This view should not be seen as simply Western chauvinism. If Western values do not flourish and prevail, it may well harm the interests of the less developed countries as well as our own. Indeed, harm them perhaps more than it harms us. For, first of all, the West offers the LDCs their most important model. The industrial democracies are preeminent at producing what most third world peoples desire, wealth and freedom. Developing nations like individuals need ex ex exemplars. Many of them, as noted, seem to be well on the road toward western style success themselves, or are trying to meld modernism with traditionalism. But recalling the idea that this volume is speculative, we should ask whether a triumphing Western culture will continue at the same pace in non-Western nations, or continue at all, if the vigor, if the vigor of the original and powerful sources of Western modernity begin to fade slowly from the scene. How solid and secure are democratic modernist values? If it should come to pass, then an ever-increasing proportion of those who espouse those values are recent converts. If they are nations with only short and tenuous histories of popular governance and industrial development, nations that may be only a step away from a coup, perhaps aided by Soviet interests, Will the Western nations develop a siege mentality, a bunker mentality that could lead to God only knows what? <laughs> will the world backslide? Uh, will the world backslide? Isn't all that more likely to happen than if the birth dirt had not come along and the older and more stable democracies had retained more of their youth and vigor, even though third world nations will be growing faster under any plausible scenario? then there are straight economic reasons why continued Western potency is of value to the LDCs. The West offers the less developed world at least two great things that should be mentioned here. One is the opportunity to share our technology, our new developments in sanitation, agriculture, communication, transportation, and medicine. 
When you see a peasant in a poor country <laughs> walking along a paved road, listening to a transitor radio, carrying a sack of rice produced by the seeds of the Green Revolution, his children inoculated with life-saving vaccines, drinking relatively pure water, you know that it is the West that has struck that spot. The other matter is access to our markets, as described earlier. We call again the late Herman Kahn's stunning paradox. The greatest agent for progress in the poor countries is the wealth of the rich countries. This wealth differential puts great value on the single most important commodity the poor nations have, low-cost labor. Ooh. There is an important market for the products that low-cost labor can produce or assemble. Textiles, cars, electronics, only when there are lots of rich people to buy those products. That wealth differential serves as a redistributionist tool. When American firms buy Mexican-made computer components, the Mexican worker, perhaps a campesino, a few years ago gets less of a wage than the U.S. worker would get, but more than the Mexican would otherwise get. Accordingly, it helps bring about progress south of or south of our border. But if the first world market shrinks while the third world labor force explodes, the third world will not do nearly as well as it would have had the first world market stayed long larger. Only the second communist world might conceivably stand to gain from the erosion of Western values. And even there, it is only the governments, not the people, that might applaud. The existence of strong political democracies serves as a source of hope for repressed individual Pol uh, Poles, Czechs, Hungarians, Ukrainians, and Balts to only begin a long list. It can be assumed that in a world with diminished Western power and values, the likelihood of freedom for them, or even the hope of freedom, may well diminish. In short, the birth earth hurts us in every conceivable geopolitical way, militarily, economically, politically, and culturally. There is yet one other way it can hurt. Personally. <laughs> <laughs> Chapter 9 what it means personally. Ah, look at the caterpillar. Hi, baby. You're so fuzzy. In the summer of 1986, ABC TV presented a three hour network special entitled After the Sexual Revolution. It dealt with women in the job market, childcare, marriage, divorce, and fewer children. It had at least a mild feminist bias. It seemed to have been filmed almost entirely in that typical American met metropo metropolis, Greater New York City. It misused or miscited some statistics, but its redeeming feature, worth the three hour wait, were some personal and candid interviews. Two were particularly poignant. The first was with an attractive 37-year-old woman. She is the head of her own business, ironically, a dating service. She talks about her business career. She talks about her earlier romances and relationships. Then she talks about wanting to get married. Here is what she said, and did. Ms. L Ms. Laura Slutsky, President People Finders. It's the loneliness and the fear that it won't happen, and I have to live alone and make my life work. Another difficult challenge, but I'll do it. I'll be classy about it at times. Nope. Reporter. Face that fear a minute for me, though. Ms. Sl Ms. Slutsky. Wait a second. This is stuff. The fear of being alone is not... I don't like it. I'll do it, though. Why am I crying? I don't want to cry. These are hard questions. The fear of being alone is hard for me. All my eye makeup that I put on is going to come off. But I'll do it. I'll do it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. <laughs> the second interviewee was, again, an attractive woman. A psychologist named Judy Kramer. Here's what she said. Judy Kramer. 
It took me a very long time to make this decision, but I always knew I wanted to have a child somehow, sometime. The way I want this baby is every blade of... What? The way I want this baby is every blade of grass in every place, that there's grass in every field and in every backyard and every meadow across America. Just about how much I want this baby. Pretty much. What?